God of mercy, grant that the word you speak this day may take root in our hearts and bear fruit to your honor and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The story of Nicodemus's conversation with Jesus is one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. And when I exegete biblical text, I'm always looking for an opening, a crack or a crevice where Jesus plants a seed or the brilliance of the Holy Spirit breaks through. I fancy myself, uh, much to my family's dismay, an amateur sleuth. I love nothing more than delving deeply into a law and order, true crime, last day, dateline, or 2020 marathon. So I'm always looking for what's going on behind the scenes or in between the lines. So let's start with Nicodemus. He's only mentioned in the Bible three times. We don't know that much about Nicodemus, except that during Jesus' time, he must have been a pretty big deal. Jesus himself describes him as a teacher of Israel. What his area of expertise is, we, we really don't know. But I think it's quite possible that he was an attorney because he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the supreme Jewish legislative and judicial court in Jerusalem under Roman rule. We can also surmise that he was wealthy because of his association with Joseph of Arimathea, who in the Gospel of Matthew was identified as a very rich man. We do know that he was one of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were a religious society of scholars and priests. The Pharisees were members of a group that believed in resurrection and following the traditions of the Old Testament fathers, believing that the law of God as it was given to Moses was meant to be interpreted according to its spirit. So in today's terms, the Pharisees would have been viewed as progressive, not in a political sense, but as a society of scholars and priests who live in a way that demonstrates their commitment to God. I think sometimes we forget that not all Pharisees were enemies of Jesus. I imagine that many of them found their way to wherever Jesus was speaking, teaching, or enjoying a meal with friends, to be within earshot, to soak up whatever knowledge he was sharing about the kingdom of heaven and the nearness of God. And here we have Nicodemus, who was a, a teacher in Israel. And as such, he must have had students or followers who were also following Jesus and reporting back to him about the miracles and the entourages following Jesus from, from town to town. So he comes to see Jesus for himself. Only he can't come during the daylight hours because of who he is. It may have put him in a precarious situation religiously, politically, socially, financially. We just don't know. Nonetheless, Nicodemus ventures out to see Jesus face to face. This might be one of those places where the Holy Spirit has found an opening. Because the nighttime visit not only ensures anonymity, it also ensures undisturbed time with Jesus. During the day, Jesus would have been surrounded by crowds of people. It would have been difficult to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. The fact that this learned, wealthy man is coming to Jesus at all should indicate to us that there's something lacking in his life. He came in darkness so that he might find light. Nicodemus, the esteemed member of Jewish society, humbles himself to become a student of Christ. And Jesus takes this moment to assuage Nicodemus' curiosity. 
adding nourishment to Nicodemus's mustard seed of faith, taking him deeper into scripture, asking him to be in discernment about the workings of the spirit through his knowledge of the Old Testament teachings and to consider the possibility of a New Testament with its new good news, the power of rebirth the birth that comes from being baptized with spirit and water, that regeneration that gives us all a foretaste of the kingdom of God. And friends, as you and I sit here in our lofty and erudite modern world, perhaps thinking, how can Nicodemus be so obtuse as to not understand what it means to be born again of the spirit? I think we need to hold the mirror up to our own faces and look more deeply. We gather for worship in a world that has fallen so far from God. We know the teachings of our faith. We can quote scripture. Many of us have been members of the church for years. But as Jesus reminds us through his conversation with Nicodemus, we are to never stop learning. There are depths to the word and the workings of God we have not yet discovered. Now there are a few movies that I don't care what time they come on, I will watch them again and again. Because every time I see the color purple, Shawshank Redemption, Fried Green Tomatoes, or Godfather One or Two, I learn something new. I see something I've not seen before or make some connection I was unaware of previously. So for me, the Bible is like an old favorite movie that I need to spend time with again and again and again, hoping to gain some new insight. And it's okay not to get it on the first read or the first try. It's all right to be like Nicodemus, leaving that initial counter with Jesus almost as confused as you were when the conversation started. What we perceive as confusing and unsettling is really an expansion, an opportunity, an opening. It's that crack through which the Holy Spirit gets in and starts doing her work. After that initial encounter with Jesus, Nicodemus could not hold on to his old precepts and rationalizations. We don't need to worry about Nicodemus because that is how a deep, penetrating, root grafting, substantive faith works. It doesn't happen overnight. Jesus left Nicodemus to sit with his discomfort, to ruminate on what it means to be born again. Now, scripture doesn't tell us that they had any other secret meetings, but the next time we see Nicodemus, he is defending Jesus in front of the great Sanhedrin. So I think it's fair to say that something happened because it is evident that Nicodemus underwent some rite of Christian initiation and that he had to have faith. He had to believe with unfailing certainty. He had to have undergone a fundamental and radical change that moves one from being a skeptic to a born again believer. It is that belief that perhaps propelled him out of darkness into the light. It is that soul-altering work that caused him to defend Jesus. The third time we see Nicodemus in the gospel, we need to understand that he is a new creation. The way he's thinking is aligned with the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus has accepted the will and the living word of God. Nicodemus has become someone he has not been, someone free for God's way in the world, someone called by God to be his true self, powered by the wind, dazzled by the crucified one, as innocent 
as one, born again. It is his love of Jesus that is built on faith, faithfulness, discipleship, and trust. That's what made Nicodemus purchase 75 pounds of expensive oils and spices so that Jesus, who was born as though he were a peasant, who lived like an itinerant preacher, could be cared for like a king in death. As we gather during Lent, let us be drawn deeply into the wisdom of God's word. Let us set aside time and humbly experience the wonder of his work. Through the waters of baptism, God brings us to new life. He claims us as children of his kingdom, as living members of his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Our scriptures today call us to seek God as Nicodemus did. It is you and I who must travel through the night or meet him in the middle of the day. It is you and I who must be like David, looking to the hills from whence our help comes as we sing that song, the song of trust that can sustain the journeys of life and the journey that life is. Jesus comes to us with a vision of his public work. He tells Nicodemus and us today that he has come not to condemn the world, but to save it. The way in which he will save it, however, is sometimes done in private. Jesus is in both private and public conversations, both public and private revelations. This famous pericope needs to be read and read again so that it might be encountered in a whole new way, a way appropriate for our time and how we handle private conversations today. We are called to be in relationship with one another to not only hold each other up prayerfully, but to hold each other accountable to doing all in our power to continuously build up and fortify this beloved community we call St. Mary's. A community where we care for and nurture each other, where our worship is centered around the risen Christ, where we love our neighbors and serve the marginalized here in Arlington and abroad. Let us use this time in Lent to delve deeper into scripture. Read our favorite stories and then read them again, seeking to deepen our relationship with Jesus. Let us be like Nicodemus, powered by the wind, not captive to the pressures and demands and dictions of the world, but seeking Jesus to respond to his invitation to be reborn. And let us be like Jesus and take that evening call to have those probing and spirit-filled conversations with one another. Amen.